Welcome to Prone to Wander Europe Bike Tour. We are Susie and Darren, an empty nester couple from Texas who packed up our bikes, flew across the world, and landed in Italy. We put our bikes back together and we have uh, started north going from Italy all the way to London. We've had some rain, some hail, some mud, some landslides that we've had to ride through. Um, we've stayed in some nice places like this with views. We've stayed in stealth camping spots like this with these kind of views. And we've stayed in a sketchy abandoned house with a view like this. And in a storm, we camped near a church with a view like this. The countryside's been beautiful. The riding has been challenging, but super fun. Um, we just love seeing the poppies everywhere and the spring flowers. We've seen a few cities and really enjoyed those, but we spend a lot of time riding in the countryside too, from town to town. Um, we are having a ball, learning all about Italy, walking through lots of beautiful cities, having a good time together, and working as a team. We have finished one month of our trip. We've got three more to go. Like and subscribe to follow our journey. Here we're gonna answer our most often asked questions. Hey guys, so we've been gone about a month now, actually exactly a month and we have gotten a whole bunch of questions so we thought we would go through a number of those just to kind of get them out of the way and to help you understand who we are what we're doing where we're going how it's going how sometimes it's not going um, and so we've written out some answers and questions i just started rambling that's fine terribly okay how about you go first for the first question then i'll, I'll give the second question okay first question where are you going so I'll show you the route. This is the route. I don't know if you can see that. But we started in the south at Fumicino Airport at Rome. And we've been going north. And if you can see the blue dot, that's where we are. And then we're going all the way to Amsterdam and then coming down a little bit more to the Hook of Holland and catching our ferry across to the UK. What has been challenging? I would say during the first part of the trip, the hills riding were the most challenging just because we're not very much used to that. Our Texas roads are it's pretty flat. So we had a couple days where I cried a lot and it took us six or eight hours to do the, route, the ride that day because it was so steep. And I couldn't even ride, I had to push my bike up hills probably two days. And sometimes I went real slow just to help you, right? Yes. He, I would say thank you so much for slowing down so that you could be at my speed, you know. That was not true. But sometimes we could keep riding, but then sometimes we were just pushing the bikes. Um, other things that have been challenging are cell service. Um, we have two different phone plans, and I have T-Mobile, and he has AT&T, but he got an eSIM for, for Europe. So sometimes my phone will work, sometimes his will work. Anyway, it's kind of, every town has been a little bit different. So that part has been a little frustrating when we don't have it, but usually one of us has service. So Susie's T-Mobile, she just kept her usual data plan and she can make phone calls and text all the time, I guess, because T-Mobile has relationships with all these companies. I got an eSIM, which was 100 gigabytes of data for I think $100. Um, to use over several months but i can't make phone calls at least if i'm supposed to be able to i don't know how to make that work so i'm having to use whatsapp because it's totally data based um, when i'm in wi-fi i can sometimes do iMessage, sometimes not it's kind of crazy but having the diversification of the plans has been sort of useful mm -hmm. um other things that have been challenging are um, we're kind of routing day by day, so sometimes finding either an Airbnb or hotel or a camping spot at the end of what, our ride that day, sometimes that's been kind of challenging. If we did, if we could plan ahead, it might be better, but anyway, that, that part's been a little challenging. Right, and so part of routing, how do you do routing? It's very difficult. Routing is hard. It's sort of become one of our phrases that we use. Sometimes if one's going too fast and the other one's going too slow, the slogan says, uh, remember we're on a tour, not a race. 
So, um, but routing is a, routing is hard is another phrase. So typically what I do is I, we have our route that I just showed you the main route, but that's not in stone. If we hear about some place that would be fun to go, uh, we try to only plan 24 hours ahead. So if we have some place we'd like to go or something we'd like to see, we just route to there and sort of go back and forth around our primary route. And the way I chose that primary route is using Kamut. They have a great feature where there's a, a little shape of a bicycle and it might be a route section or it might be something interesting to see or something that other cyclists have really enjoyed. And they actually have a score where you know, 27 out of 29 cyclists have recommended this or whatever. So I picked basically along our 1500 mile journey, um, just different spots that I thought would be fun. They, tend, they tended to go through spots that are well known. Um, but so our main routes, routes along Kamut and then uh, using Google, I'll Using Kamut, I'll figure out our average distance. We want to shoot for about 32 kilometers a day, which is about 20 miles. The first part of our trip, just trying to figure out how to make it work, we were averaging 25 miles a day, which makes us end our trip in too early. So 20 miles a day gets us done about the time we need to um, in 90 days. Um, so I'll figure out where the end should be, and then around the end point, when I know we'll be pooped and grumpy and tired and hungry, I try to find either a camping spot that looks good or a campground. And if not those, then a hotel. If not a hotel, then a agriturismo, which is really just an, an old, I don't know, it's, they're usually uh, estates that in order to supplement their income, they uh, rent out rooms by the night. So it's kind of like a hotel, but it's almost more like a bed and breakfast. Agriturismo, um, or uh, so hotel, agriturismo, campground, or wild camping. If we can find a place on Google Maps, um, and then well, anyway, so somewhere around the endpoint, we try to figure out one of those. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, sometimes we think we'll be camping and we end up in a hotel. Sometimes we think we'll be in a hotel and we find a great campground. So anyway, it's a little bit flexible. I use a combination, so maps.me is a, uh, a software that, it's actually an app, but I downloaded the entire continent of Europe. So it has every country and all the bike routes from Italy all the way up to uh, the Netherlands. And it does a great job of picking out the best bicycle routes, but then I combine maps.me with Kamut that had is specifically oriented towards bicycling and touring and bike paths and gravel and um, safe roads. And then I put all that, sometimes I'll, I'll, when you put it on Kamut, it automatically puts it to the Garmin Connect app, which puts it on my uh, Garmin Edge 1040. So that's how I go. Is how do you eat or cook? Well, we um, we started off with the stove and pots and pans and thought we were going to cook a lot, but then we got here and I forgot to buy fuel, so we didn't end up cooking for the first almost two weeks. And we just go to a coffee shop for breakfast, stop at a place for lunch, and the food has been um, pretty cheap, not too expensive. And then we usually want to go to a restaurant for dinner just to try local specialties, and um, the food's always been so good. So we got rid of the pots, got rid of the stove, and now we can't really cook, but we do pick up groceries like bread and salami and cheese and some fruits that we keep on the bike. So if we aren't near a restaurant when it's lunchtime, we just make our own little picnic lunch. Have we had a vegetable since we left home? We've had salad a few times. Yeah, I mean, we bought carrots, tomatoes. Yeah, carrots, good. Tomato, I think that's a fruit, isn't it? Tomato, yes. So that's how we cook. Yep. Oh, and it was, it was because of the weight that we ended up tossing the... Yes. That's another question. Yes. Oh, that is. Sorry. Yeah. I don't mean to get ahead of myself. It's okay. All right. Let's see. The budget. How much do you spend a day? Um, I've been keeping track in a little book with how much we spend for accommodation and food and 
bike repair things, I don't know, everything is in there. And it, it's, at this point, we are spending about $161 a day. And we like to get a little bit less, spend a little bit less than that. But that's, that's, that's about how much everything is cost because we have been staying in hotels average five nights a week and either a tent stealth camping or a campground about two nights a week. And so if we could camp more, we would save a lot more money. All right, so the hope is that as we go further north, we'll get closer to, um, the closer we get to Brussels, there are more uh, welcome to my garden sites and campgrounds. Um, those aren't very common, Campeggios in Italy. Um, they're not very common. Um, and people aren't very eager to let you camp in their gardens, so we found out one time when we asked the lady. We were so tired. <laughs> we asked the lady, can she we said, camp in your yard? And she said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Have a nice day. Um, so, but there, it's, Welcome to My Garden is centered in around Brussels. And so, we're hoping, as we, as we look on the map, there are a lot more of those sites. And there's people who are cyclists that open up their yard and just say, hey, come stay at our at our home, stay in our, you camp in our yard, you can use the restroom, water you, closet. And our electricity, you can charge your devices and get water. And stuff. Yes, so that sounds great. So hopefully as we go a little further north, um, our costs will come down a bit. Yeah. Your turn. Oh, my turn. Did you sell your house? <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot more hours in a day when you live small. Um, but no, Philip and Lexi are they just got married five days ago. Um, they're living in our house until we get back in three more months. We're so thankful for them. Um, they're taking care of our dog, Cat, um, and some of the chores around the house. Mm -hmm. and, we're, and they're college students that just graduated. Yes. So they're young and very sweet. Yes. I'm very thankful for those guys. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. When stealth camping, do you ever feel unsafe? Um, that's a funny question. So stealth camping or wild camping is kind of part of the um, fun or the game of bike touring. And people do this all over the world. So we, we started watching some YouTube videos of, a, of couples that do this and it just kind of is part of the adventure. Way to go wheels to wander. Wheels to wander mm -hmm. is a big one. Giant Cheerio is another one. Anyway, so um, the times that we've stealth camped in like pastures, like we, if there's a private property sign, we don't go. If there's a, a gate and a fence, like a locked gate, we don't go. But if it's just kind of open land and we can stay away from the road and not really be seen, we've done that several times. And so in pastures, it has felt totally safe. And if somebody asked us to leave, we would say, oh, no problem. Or we could say, can we pay you to camp in your field? But um, one time a, a storm was coming, so we, looked and we saw an abandoned building and um, it was kind of in the country, not, anyway, it was pretty scary. Like the ceiling was falling in and windows were busted out. And anyway, um, it was kind of getting dark. And so we, we went inside and, and stayed for a little while thinking, okay. <laughs> oh, that, that's fine, that's quite fine. <laughs> then people came up and if you didn't see the video, some other people discovered us in the abandoned house and it was kind of, scary for a brief moment um, and another time we camped in um, next to a church because it was cold we couldn't find a hotel couldn't find any place to camp so we just kind of camped next to the church in the rain in, in a little grassy place and I kind of was hoping somebody would discover us and bring us in but they didn't but I didn't really feel unsafe so that's all Smith do you have one I don't get to respond to your questions. Oh, you can. Go ahead. Do you ever feel unsafe? In the abandoned house, I felt scared. But then there was a layer of dirt over everything so you could see every footprint from, and you could tell there hadn't been anybody in that building for ever. And then Shazam. We're there and we have two guests in the same situation that are bike touring and looking for a place to stay the night and it was two silly French girl doctors. Crazy. Mm -hmm. It was so fun. If you're out there, hope your trip went well. <laughs> um, I have one more question. Ah, how's my Italiano? We've been here a month, full immersion, and my Italiano is 
non-existent. It's terrible. Non parlo italiano. Parlese inglese. I think that's or parle inglese is that's pretty much my favorite. But your Spanish is excellent. My Spanish is excellent. And most of the time people understand what you're talking about when you speak Spanish. I met this great guy last night who is in town, is there from Mexico, from Querétaro, and they his son is, I think, probably 16, 17, 18, is here for the World Championships of reigning horses. Um, and they're from Mexico. I said, hey, man, I like your boots. And he said, oh, you do? And he started speaking in Spanish. He said, you speak Spanish? I said, yes. <laughs> so we talked for a long time in Spanish, morphed into English because it's, anyway, he's just a great guy. So we think we're going to go tomorrow maybe to see his son compete at 8 o'clock on our way out of town. So. That should be fun. <laughs> anyway, Carla, if you're there, we're rooting for your son. Okay, I have one more. What have you gotten rid of? Well, I already mentioned, oh, the bikes were too heavy to start off. I had packed way too much stuff. So the hills were so hard. I was struggling a lot. So we got, got rid of the stove and the pots and all the, any kind of food that had to be cooked. And I got rid of, I brought a book, got rid of that got rid of some clothes, like an extra pair of bike shorts, extra t-shirts, what else did I get rid of? We got rid of our camping chairs that we thought were gonna be useful, but they just took up a lot of room. So we got rid of those. I got rid of an extra backpack I was gonna use. I don't know, I think there's 20 things on the list. Extra cords and charging things. I don't know, but it made my, our, our bikes, my bike weigh a whole lot less, so it's easier to ride. So it was worth it. I just wish I hadn't packed all that extra stuff. And I got rid of a chair, the same thing you did. And a pair of underwear. <laughs> and maybe one pair of socks. Yes, I got rid of some socks too. But I did keep the puffy jacket and the rain gear because, and that's been important to use, which is good. But maybe after we get over the Alps and it's more July, maybe get send that back home or get rid of the puffy jacket and the extra warm clothes just because they're taking up space and they weigh, they weigh a lot. We also found that the rain gear, even though we thought we've used rain gear before and felt just as wet inside as we did outside, but if the driving cold rain <clears throat> is hitting you fresh all the time, it just gets freezing. So even though you're a little damp, pretty damp inside the rain gear, at least you're warm and damp instead of cold and damp. So anyway, we're keeping that. Well, if you come up with any other questions, let us know in the comments and we'll try to answer them in the future. But thanks for watching. We appreciate it. And we're having a great time. It is challenging, but we're having a great time. Thanks.